So, I was living in Chicago, my hometown, in my early 20s, working as a freelance writer and a waiter, and also having a quarter-life crisis. I was stumbling around, making lots of bad decisions. I'm sure none of you have done this in your early 20s. I decided I needed a change of scenery. I needed to hit the reset button. As a journalist by training, one of my mentors suggested that in order to get out of my rut, I should either move to New York and be prepared to fight for a spot in a dog-eat-dog -dog industry, or move to a smaller market where I could develop my creative voice. The second one sounded better, and so my boyfriend and I packed our bags, broke our lease, and moved to Nashville with no money, no network, and no plans. And then a few months later, we broke up. Awesome. <laughs> All of a sudden, I was on my own without a community to comfort me. I felt alone and unhinged. Late nights of binge drinking weren't getting me anywhere. And I was also dealing with a lot of feelings of self-loathing at this time. I can honestly say I didn't accept myself as I was. And to top all of that off, I felt as though I was losing my creative voice. While I was grateful to be freelancing for so many different publications, flip-flopping from one to the next had made me feel split in two. I needed a community. I needed a creative anchor. The problem with journalism is we are trained to focus on the task at hand, getting all those juicy details from our subjects, no matter what it takes. There's no room for the writer in the story, and you don't want your subject wasting time telling you random facts about their life because, hey man, you've got an impending deadline. And so, you keep the subject focused and the relationship neutral. But if we're honest with ourselves, we do this all of the time in real life. Perfect example, we're in a bad mood, we have an appointment to get our hair cut, and now we know for the next 20 minutes we have to make chit-chat with a complete and total stranger. Uh, so, what do we do? Turn into a stereotypical journalist. How long have you been cutting hair? What do you like to do on the weekends for fun? It can be an exhausting 20 minutes. Or we can look at these moments differently. It is possible to experience joy from talking to strangers. In fact, talking to strangers has become as essential to my own self-care routine as taking a vitamin or exercising. We're taught it's common courtesy to keep our personal problems to ourselves. Don't burden strangers with your issues. They don't care. If they know too much, they might not be nice to you. And you know what? Who cares what they think about us anyway? Guys, those last three statements are lies. Over the last 13 years, I've written three books and conducted well over a thousand interviews, all with the sole purpose of getting to know my subjects and what matters most to them in life. Today, I would like to challenge everyone watching to look at conversations with strangers differently, not as traps, but rather opportunities to restore energy and engage in a very important and oftentimes lacking form of self-care. Okay, so I'm sitting at my kitchen table, boyfriendless, inspirationless, moneyless, when I remember an assignment I was given in college by my professor who said to us one day class, go out and find five people in five different fields you're interested in and ask them how they got from point A to B in their careers and any lessons they learned along the way. It was a simple assignment, but I loved it. And so I thought, why not try that again? I needed to get to know my new city, Nashville, to understand the Southern culture, which I knew nothing about. And most importantly, I needed a project that was wholly my own. So I sat down, wrote out a quick pitch, explaining I'm working on this coffee table book about people in Nashville, crossed my fingers, and began sending it out. And that's when I met Sarah Barlow, a photographer whose big break was photographing the cover art for the Taylor Swift albums Red in 1989, along with her creative partner, Stephen Schofield. 
Sarah and Stephen had this beautiful way of describing their process, which was, how do you turn strangers into friends? The goal is to see something beautiful about them and document it. I realized in that moment, I wanted to connect with my subjects on more of a heart level. As Sarah and Stephen had summed it up so perfectly, people, even superstars, respond to warmth, to kindness, and to someone looking for the best in them. They had proved it was possible. And so I decided to give it a shot. I started paying attention to what mattered most to my subjects, even if it wasn't seemingly relevant to their profession. I encouraged them to tell me anything they wanted to, simply because I wanted to get to know them. And in return, I shared how their words were moving me. So, like a Robert Frost poem, my way was leading on to ways, and I soon found myself interviewing Mike Wolf, creator and star of the TV show American Pickers, which is a show about people who go treasure hunting for antiques. Well, Mike was very pleasant, and I was delighted to be interviewing him, I felt at a certain point like the conversation wasn't really going anywhere. We weren't really connecting. Instead of sticking to my initial journalistic instinct, which would have been just staying true to my talking points, I thought, stop, recalibrate, think through everything that's been said so far, and ask yourself, what would you say to Mike if he were your friend? I remembered earlier in the conversation, Mike had made a comment that made it sound as though he was a bit overwhelmed by his newfound fame. Maybe it hadn't mentally caught up with him yet, understandably, that people were willing to wait in line for his autograph. I knew Mike had recently become a father and had read somewhere while doing my research that he was passionate about the children who watched his show, child pickers as he called them. And so I brought this up and immediately, the interview shifted. Mike talked about how the letters he received from children had brought him a lot of joy during a very stressful period in his life. He thanked me after the interview for reminding him of this purity amidst a new pressure-filled existence. The idea that an interviewer could positively impact a subject had never really crossed my mind before. Our subjects are supposed to be a means to an end. Keep them happy, sure, but at a distance, because they don't care about you, and you shouldn't care about them. But the truth was, I did care about Mike, and I enjoyed hearing the stress lift from his voice when he talked about how those letters had kept him grounded. When I was a child, I was very sensitive, and still am. <laughs> Other kids, even friends of mine, made fun of me for being so emotional. We all know that feeling of not being able to be totally honest about our true feelings, even with those closest to us, for fear that they might judge or stop loving us. And if we can't be honest with those closest to us, then why would we be honest with a stranger? I was introduced to Callie Devaney, founder of popular salon Parlor and Juke, through my photographer Joshua, who warned me before the interview Kelly's a very private person, not the greatest thing to know before an interview. <laughs> However, <laughs> it turned out that Kelly and I had a lot in common. She confided in me that she was also a misunderstood teenager who felt as though she couldn't totally be her authentic self. She thanked me after the interview for making her feel comfortable enough to open up. She went on to explain that she had created her salon to be a place where anyone, even misfits, could feel at home. I realized in that moment that I wanted my own place of work, my interview chair, to be a place where my subjects could be honest with me as well as with themselves. And in order to do this, I had to show them that I was a real person with my own feelings of pain, stress, self-doubts, and sadness. Logically, we might know this is true, that we all experience these things, but going through life pretending like everything's fine all the time with our protective shields up, it can be easy to forget. Not too long after, I met Kim Green, a tremendous writer who said to me, 
I love interviews because they take away my inner critic, which everyone has as a normal civilian. Kim touched on an interesting point of journalism, objectivity. She went on to say that even though she finds herself making judgments in real life, as we all do, in the interview setting, she could simply be excited about what was being said. Now, we all have a running monologue going through our minds at all times of the day, often filled with criticism. So the real question for me became, how do we turn this off? And that's when I realized this is more than just about journalism and writing books. We all have the ability to approach others like a curious writer, eager to hear what they have to say, quite simply because they matter. In my interview with Chet Weiss, founder of live poetry event series, Poetry Sucks, great title by the way, he said to me, I would compare participating in a poetry reading to talking with a stranger in a bar. People have the tendency to share more with those they don't know. Now, I've actually been a bartender and could tell you many, many stories about people sharing very private details about their lives with me, probably because I had no preconceptions or personal attachments to them. In my 14 years of working in the service industry, I always try to see it as my duty to serve others, to help them enjoy their brief escape from life. In a conversation with a stranger, the ability to free yourself from the burden of judgment and simply enjoy the other person as they are in that moment actually allows you the ability to hit the reset button and remember what it's like to be yourself. By giving my subjects the space to be real, I got to be real too. It was an act of service that gave me back as much as I gave to it. In my interview with Sergeant Michael Fisher, community relations officer for the East Nashville Precinct, he said to me, in doing this job, you see, instead of listening, most people are simply formulating their argument in their head while you talk. However, if you can put your ego aside and really allow the other person's words to sink in, you might see things from a different perspective. In doing so many different jobs in the police department, Michael had realized that how we interact with others actually dictates how they respond to us. In a way, we're all just mirroring one another. Now, when I'm in a conversation with someone and their words start to bother me, which it's real life, is often, let's get real, <laughs> instead of immediately taking offense like I used to, I ask myself, what is it about what they're saying that's making me feel bad? And if it's the fact that their words are grating on my ego, well, can I put that aside in order to hear their truth? Michael, who's referring to conflict resolution, instilled in me a deeper sense of self-awareness, which has dramatically impacted the way that I deal with others in my interviews and in real life. Which leads to the final lie we tell ourselves, which is that strangers don't have anything to offer us because they haven't directly invested into our lives. So, who cares what they have to say? But that's what Michael was talking about. Too often in conversation, we stick to our own perspective because that's safe. However, if we can push our own thoughts aside and really listen to the other person, we might come to a new truth. I was raised around all artists and never was really around any business people my whole life before moving to Nashville crazy, I know, opposite bubble most people grow up in. That is until I met Van Tucker, co-founder of Avenue Bank, who said to me, while well, I don't write, paint, or take photographs, I consider myself a business artist. The statement was like revolutionary for me. I never heard anything like it before. The fact that someone I considered a traditional business person considered themselves an artist. I loved it, especially since it was around the time that I realized I needed to learn more about business in order to further my own career. Being raised around all artists, again, I had maybe been led to believe that business was 
kind of boring, or perhaps that I didn't have a natural inclination for it. Which is why Van's simple statement combined with her enthusiasm was actually so powerful that it inspired me to sign up for a business class at an entrepreneur training center that summer where I studied and actually ended up developing a partnership with that same center the following year. All of this stemmed from a simple statement from a stranger. By simply opening myself up to the idea that a stranger's words could positively impact me, they quite literally changed the course of my life. Talking to strangers can either be the worst parts of your day or the moments that you most look forward to. The interview in my London-based series that was most powerful for me really wasn't because of any particular words that were exchanged but rather the respect that my subject showed to me during a very difficult time in my life, royal biographer Robert Lacey. Robert, who was so kind, generous with his time, and patient, never made me feel dumb for asking the simplest questions. He showed me that teachers love a good student, and he made me feel as though I could talk to anyone even if I had initially thought they were out of my league. And it turns out it was fun for him too, as he told me later, because I had offered my time with no expectations, showed him my true self, and given him the space to reflect upon his incredible career. We bonded and both benefited, and it was great. So today, three books and many writing projects later, I continue to seek out conversations with strangers because they nourish me. My subjects give me kindness and generosity when I need it most. They give me the space to be myself as I give that space to others. And most importantly, we learn from one another and challenge all of those beliefs that we thought were true. By learning to accept so many different people who were often very different from myself, I learned to love and accept me. By talking to people about their purpose in life, I found my own. And by looking for the absolute best in others, they brought out the best in me. So today, I would like to encourage everybody to go out and introduce yourself to someone new, especially someone you think isn't all that much like you, but leave your preconceptions behind. Open yourself to the idea that you can be a friend to this person, and I promise you, more often than not, they will be a friend right back. And in a world that feels very divisive, we can all use more friends.